All right, my dears. Good to see you. Hang on just a minute. Let me do one last thing. Okay. And good evening. It is now 7 o'clock here in Northern California. Um, many of you are also here in Northern California, so you will agree with me that that is, in fact, what time it is. Those of you who are elsewhere, you may have different opinions. Anyway, good to see you. Um, I'm Tad, as usual. Um, this is something that I struggle with every day of my life. I'm still Tad. I probably will always be Tad, but that's my battle to, to fight, not yours. Um, anyway, good to see you. Nice to be here. Um, I am, as I mentioned when I announced that I would be doing something this weekend, I am mainly going to just be chatting for a little while just to bring everybody up to date, and then I am going to ask you guys to help me out on making a decision, uh, which will come, not right now, but during t the course of the next half hour. And um, I will also uh, just be kind of talking about what might happen next in a general sense, which is part of that decision. And just generally fill you in on what's been going on for the last few weeks. So um, that's pretty much it. And um, I'm also going to do my best to check in and uh, see if I can see comments. Um, yes, I see a few. All right, good. So I see Naomi. Hello, Emily. Hello, Mr. Unangst. Mr. Unangst. Good to see you. And Barban, hello, hello. Those are folks who've showed up uh, and signed in so far. I also see, oh, I see my wife. Hello, Deborah. Hello, darling. Um, and Medardo. And I see Jeremy. Hello, hello. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, I am going to mostly just kind of fill you in on what's been going on. And then I will ask you the questions that I want to ask about where we should go next. So, um, I think this is the first time I've been on for almost two months, which is a long gap um, since that's only happened once or twice since the onset of the COVID pan, uh, pandemic. Um, but uh, this time it was because we finished the Witchwood Crown and I was going out of town, or to be perfectly accurate, Deborah and I were going out of town, and we did. We went to Germany. Um, again, for those of you who watched last night's or who have seen it, um, you know, now already on YouTube or something, I'm gonna go over a lot of the same information. So I'm just warning you, I don't think there's anything particularly new that's going to be happening here. Um, but anyway, enough said. So we flew off to Germany on uh, Condor Airlines, which has these really cool dragonfly striped planes. Deborah and I were both very pleased by that. The one that we had going out and coming back, different plane, but both of them had green stripes um, along the body, concentric stripes, which looked like they were supposed to be circles all the way around the fuselage. Um, but at it, the uh, first the Frankfurt airport and then later at the San Francisco airport, we saw that there were many different colors which was very cool. So I, I know it sounds like a funny thing to get worked up about, but, but for, for one thing, I would, I'm never particularly like airplane travel anyway. Um, I'm not phobic anymore, but I, I, it's not my favorite thing to do. So to have a plane that at least you think looks cool and that you've never seen before, that was pretty cool. Um, so by the time we got to Frankfurt, we were like watching all the planes coming in and looking for other Condor airline planes and trying to figure out, you know, oh, that's one, look, ooh, yellow, yellow stripes, ooh, red stripes, because they were just, that's it, that was their entire package, was um, white planes with, with colored stripes on them. Um, it was very cool. Um, and we, we were thinking, we were kind of calling them dragonfly planes because they had that kind of look like some of the dragonflies we have in our backyard. So very cool. Anyway, so Deb and I got to Germany. Um, the short version is it was a lovely trip. We had a really nice time. Everybody was super nice to us. Um, we, had, we spent a lot of time staying with our friend Ilva, um, who was going through a family crisis at that point. So we were glad that we were able to be there because she's one of our dear friends. Um, that was tough, but um, not on us so much, but obviously on our, our friend. Um, and then we had a lot of other cool experiences, just, you know, people were super nice, and, you know, we, we went to all these different cities and did readings and stuff. I did my best to not read the same thing 
every time. So I cut up the first two chapters of the new book, Navigator's Children, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, and uh, cut that into three pieces, basically, um, and read those. And uh, yeah, we had a lovely time. The only problem was that at the moment, and uh, many of the Americans in the audience may not know this, but Germany's having a lot of problems with their trains, which is kind of the opposite of what you normally expect in Germany. So we spent a lot of time dashing from track to track when trains got changed at the last moment and stuff like that. And if you're carrying a two and a half weeks worth of packing uh, in a big 50 pound uh, you know, suitcase, it, it is not much fun to run across a large German train station trying to get to another track at the last moment. But we did okay because of help from Ilva and Mareika, who is the, uh, the person who was organizing the tour for us there, who uh, works for Klett, our German publishers. So um, we still made it to all the gigs, and that's all that really mattered. I, I, it was not personal inconvenience that was worrisome, um, be, but it's the fact that when you're on a tour like this, people are expecting you, and there are events set up, and other people involved, and the people who've come, and all that stuff. So the last thing you want to do is either be really late or miss a gig entirely. And that did not happen. Um, I still don't think that's ever happened to me with a, a book signing gig, um, knock wood. And um, that all went well, despite the problems with the train. So we had a lovely trip in Germany. Um, as I mentioned last night in passing, um, it's just really heartening. Writing is a fairly solitary process. Um, you know, one goes to one's laptop or whatever you happen to use, pad and pen, and um, then you go down into your brain uh, and you live in the world that you're inventing and you think like the characters that you're writing and all that kind of stuff. And um, then you surface and every now and then when you're having a bad day, and everybody does have bad days, even writers, I know it's shocking to consider, but even writers, um, going out and meeting the people who are actually reading the books and waiting for the next book and things like that is, um, it's a real boost. It's, it's a huge energy donation on the part of the people who are doing it. And, and um, I, I came to realize in a way that I had sort of before, but it became even clearer to me <coughs> that obviously because I write for a living, the first and most important thing is to be able to help support my family, you know, our Deborah's and my family. And that is the first thing, obviously, but that's a practical thing. That's practical. But at this point in my life, other than the practicality of not wanting any of the people in our family to starve and die, um, the thing that I find most moving and most exciting about going out on tour is that I meet people and they're talking about my my work in a way that reminds me of how I felt about some of my favorite things. And I feel like, okay, I am paying it forward to use the old Heinleinian story. Um, you know, that instead of simply paying back the person who, who helped get me started, I am paying it forward to other people. And just as the books that I loved by Bradbury and Tolkien and, and Barbara Tuckman and all these other people, I can't pay them back. They're all mostly gone now. Um, but I can at, at least maybe have an effect on the next generation of writers and encourage people to try and, and, and take their own stories and make them available and share them with people. And so when people make it clear to me that they have a really strong emotional interaction or response to something I've done, that's a very satisfying feeling, that feeling that like, okay, I am continuing. I am part of the river of whether you want to call it literature or writing or books or stories, whatever you want to call it. I'm not trying to be fancy here and I'm not trying to take on some kind of artistic mantle. Just saying, what if, let's just call it storytelling. I am paying forward the, the, the pleasure, excitement, and really mystery that the writers of my upbringing gave to me. So that's really exciting, and a, and a book tour is always a way to be reminded of that. And um, believe me, I, I take advantage of it. I mean, in the sense that I really feel it. 
And I love that. And it also helps to get me through some of those days where I'm just feeling like, oh my God, I've got so much to do. And is, does anybody even care out there? Well, apparently some people do care and bless them for that. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled by that. So anyway, Deborah and I were treated extremely well as we have been in the past in Germany and most places we've gone, to be honest. Um, and so the trip went very well. We came back to our niece having arrived a couple days early from England, basically the day after we got back. So we love Rhiannon and it was really good to have her, but it's also one of those things where like I was just ready to crash for a week and instead we were doing lots of things and running around and being hosts as, as happens. So as you noticed, although I've managed to remove some of the stuff behind me and I'm in the process of finally bringing the office back to some kind of human standard <laughs> of what is acceptable, um, I, I have not finished yet. And part of that is because, okay, so I came back. That was the other thing. I came back. Not only did we have a, a beloved family guest who showed up the next day, but then I had a whole bunch of work to do um, with the help of others, I hasten to say, um, on the last flaming shards of <laughs> Navigator's Children, which included, you know, seeing that the maps got finished and seeing that the appendix got finished and making a last pat, my, my, pass through the typeset proofs. Typeset, in this case, being done by computer, not by lead anymore, but basically it's the, the equivalent of that process where you have committed, you have put everything down, and then you have to have a last look to pick up any problems. So that was one thing that I had to deal with. Um, I've just received a package of 100, uh, 1,500 uh, what we call tip-ins, which are special pages that will be put into a book when it's being published. And I just received 1,500 tip-ins to sign, so that's on my plate. I've already started doing that. And uh, Navigator's Children is pretty much done and out of my hands, but I still have the last of the Ordinary Farm books, my draft, which Deb finally had a chance to read. I shouldn't say finally like she was being slow about it because she wasn't. I mean, it took me like two and a half years to get to it. Um, but Deb had a chance to read it and give me her feedback on it. And so that's something I still have to finish. Um, all of this, of course, was while I'm trying to get ready to write The Splintered Sun, which is going to be the next new book that I write. And, you know, just all the usual craziness. Um, again, no complaints about any of this. This is uh, uh, the life that I wanted to have, and I'm very happy with it. So I'm just letting you know what all is going on. Um, everything was fine in our absence. No losses or explosions or uh, fatalities among the animals and people in the household while we were gone. Johnny was very happy. Big dog Johnny was very happy to have us back, needless to say. Um, I have just kind of come to realize more than ever before that he is the most complicated, emotionally complicated animal I've ever lived with, which I tend to think is a sign of intelligence in a sense, if only in the, in the sense that he is not all one thing or another at any one time, you know, he's not all hooray life or, oh, I'm miserable or, you know, yes, I'm happy. No, I'm unhappy. He's, it's like always a complicated mixture. And the more that I live with a dog like Johnny, who is not, you know, he's, he's not like solving problems like the way that crows or raccoons or whatever do. But it's clear that there is a real complicated machinery going on inside of him in terms of how he sees the world and his feelings about it. Um, so Johnny is okay. Very happy to have us back. Still complicated. Uh, Walter, small Chihuahua dog, our older dog, is completely nuts. Um, I, here's something else I said last night, but I'll say it again because it's interesting. Um, I have often referred to Walter's journey towards senility um, as saying, oh, Walter's getting really doolally, which is a Britishism um, that I picked up either from Deb or when I was living there or from reading British and English and British literature most of my life. Um, but I always assumed do lally was, was some kind of Irish slang that had crept over into the English vernacular. Um, for those of you who don't know the expression, do lally just means kind of losing it, kind of nuts, um, crazy, silly, 
senile. You know, it could mean any of those things. So I always assumed that it was an Irish expression because of that, that lally sound on the end of it. Sounded to me like it might be from, from Ireland originally. Um, no, in fact, I just discovered that it actually is Hindi. And it comes from, apparently, from a uh, place called Dualali, which was where they had a medical hospital, a military hospital for the troops who were being shipped back from the Indian part of the British Empire in the 18th and 19th century um, back to England. And so if you wound up in that hospital because you were not yet fit to go back to America, it was referred to as being, you know, at Dulali or probably after a while, just do lally, um, which I did not know, and now I do. So that was an exciting thing to discover while I was thinking about a chihuahua and wondering where the origin of his condition comes from. Let me think. So, okay, so that's most of the stuff um, that has happened. As I mentioned, I, we're making, we're, you know, we moved in back in in like February, but we've had a zillion things going on, um, not least of which this last tour and visitation and work and all that and Deborah is working hard on her stuff too she's doing her fabric art and spending a great deal of time and energy on that but also on various other business financial stuff we, we've had terrible luck with with uh, that kind of stuff lately through no fault of Debs so she's been busy continuously you know on the phone or or you know emailing people saying why did you lose our money <laughs> or why are we being charged for this when we didn't do that or you know that kind of stuff which is just a constant in the modern world it is just a constant i mean i i, I imagine the more complicated your situation gets the worse it gets but people have a lot of money unlike say ordinary folk people have a lot of money they pay other people to just take care of all that stuff and in fact there are entire legions of lawyers and accountants who make their living uh, keeping that kind of crap away from from expensively uh, or, sorry super rich people they expensively keep that stuff away from rich people but the rest of us just have to put up with whatever the system does so Deb poor Deb has been working really hard on a lot of stuff like that so as a result, we are kind of slowly dealing with things around here and attaching things and putting things away and, you know, finding furniture that, you know, et cetera. Anyway, it's not interesting. I don't mean to get into a big thing. But so that's a lot of what we've been doing. And um, so, you know, every day I get up and I go, what do I have to do? I have to sign tip-ins. I have to work on the uh, third ordinary farm book. I have to do, you know, this. I need to go, you know, replace that doorknob. I need, you know, I need to take more boxes out to the garage. It's, it's just life. So I'm not complaining about it, but I cannot wait to get back to more normal sort of behavior in the next few weeks and be just getting up every day and going, okay, what am I supposed to write? Which is how I like it. Anyway, so... Now we come down to the substance of the other stuff that I wanted to talk to you guys about. So that was the main thing. Oh, but before I do, let me just check and see who else has popped in and say hello. So, uh, oh, there's a new name I didn't, I haven't seen, I don't think before. Keith Duperreau. Um, at least that's how it's spelled, and I'm giving it the French pronunciation. So lovely. Um, and Mark, hello, Mark. Good to see you. Mark is a is is a friend, and it's always good to see him. Um, are you guys going to show me any of the other comments? No, of course not. Nikki, hello, Nikki. Um, who else? Isaac, good to see you, Isaac. Angie, Tracy, and Naomi. I think I already said hello to, but hello, Naomi. Uh, Barb and Brenda. Hello, Brenda. That's Brenda Doss. Uh, Medardo, I already said hello to, and Keith, and uh, again, Keith, I'm saying du perro, because that's how it's spelled, but, uh, and you, you're from Canada, so I'm guessing you might be from a family that has French ancestry, um, but if I'm wrong on that, and you guys just say du peralt or something like that, please feel free to let me know. Mark, I already said hello to, that's Mark Gamble, and Christy, hello, Christy and Susan, Christy Sanders and Susan Shamblin. So hello to all of them. Jeremy, did I say hello to you? If I didn't, I apologize um, because I definitely want to say hello. Jeremy is one of the people along with Angela Welchel, Ron Hyde and Ilva von Leunhausen who, uh, who have been working 
tirelessly and with no recompense whatsoever except gratitude on the Navigator's Children and before that on the preceding books in the series. And they have been uh, absolutely invaluable as far as keeping the books canon because uh, I've, I've said this before, because when I started rewriting these, or writing this new story, The Last King of Ostenard, I had not read the books again. I had read little bits and pieces of them just for, for certain reasons of, you know, uh, accuracy or whatever, but I hadn't just sat down and read this, the books since I, since The Dragon Bone Chair came out in 1988. So, um, they knew the books much better than I did. They'd read them several times and they knew the books better than I did. And so they have been a huge amount of help, not only in, in the physical sense of working on, they worked on the appendices for these books and did a bunch of other things. And um, Ron helped uh, Isaac Stewart with the maps and advising on the maps. And they all did a ton of work, um, again, for free, out of the goodness of their hearts. But they also helped me keep focused on not just the, the, the specific facts of Ostenard, which they did. You know, Tad, you can't use that character. He was smashed by a rock in, you know, previous trilogy or whatever. But in terms of also keeping the feeling, because since all of them are um, longtime readers of the original series, they have very firm feelings about them. And that's wonderful. I'm so grateful for that. So if I did something in the new books that they weren't happy with, they let me know about it. And while I don't know if I ever fully changed my mind on anything, I definitely heard what they were saying. Um, I did add things in or whatever where they had pointed out that that didn't really explain that that character doesn't seem like they do that and stuff like that. So I am forever grateful to them. And Jeremy, of course, who I've just said hello to, Jeremy is one of them. And uh, Jeremy, who's had a very, very busy, tough year too, just sent me a whole bunch of stuff at the last moment, which we managed to incorporate um, fairly uh, thoroughly into the, the final draft. So having done all that and said hello to everybody that was showed up on my part of the thing where I can see it, um, I am going to move along now to the last part, because I, as I said, I'm not gonna read tonight and I'm probably not gonna go much more than another five or 10 minutes. But the last part of what um, I need from you guys, and that is to decide, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep this slot or these two slots open to keep doing things. In the long run, I will have to come up with some other ideas. But at the moment, as is often the case with me, I am involved with so many things, I can't really properly plot a course change and, and go through all the different ideas of trying to work up a, a, what a, a different kind of regular broadcast would be. So what I'm asking from you all, and I did this at the in the 1, 1 a.m. Uh, broadcast as well, I want you guys to help me and I'm going to give you three basic types of things that I could be reading right now. And I would love for as many of you as possible to tell me which one would be your choice, okay? Uh, I do want to go on reading, especially while I'm trying to figure out what the long-term future of this broadcast thing um, is going to be. So um, I have read through all my short stories and I have read the first volume of a number of my books. I don't ever want to read an entire book on the air because I have concerns about the um, intellectual property laws and whether I would not be putting my copyright at risk by making a version of it, even if it's a version of me reading it out loud, completely available on the internet. So since I don't know about that and may, nobody really knows because there's not a lot of case law on a lot of this stuff, um, which is why there are all these people out there pirating stuff directly off the internet, and that's entire whole books and things like that, and and then just pay, you know posting them for other people to access for free. Um, anyway, so the first possibility, possibility one, is that I could read second volumes of some of these other things. There's you know I I only read Dragonbone Chair. Um, I could read Stone of Farewell. I only read the first Otherland, City of Golden Shadow. I could read River of Blue Fire. 
Um, I read the first Shadow March. I could read the second one, which is named, called Shadow Play, if I remember correctly. Um, and I could actually read the second book um, of this particular series since we've got the fourth and final book coming out in November. Um, so I already just finished The Witchwood Crown, but I could just steam right on into Empire of Grass. So that's, that's possibility one, is to um, utilize more of my own stuff and read some second volumes of things. The second one, so that's one. That's possibility one, my own, more of my own stuff. The second possibility is there are a number of writers, who many, most of whom are not alive anymore, whose work was super formative for me. Um, and uh, they are wonderful writers that some of you, maybe even a lot of you, haven't read. I'm thinking of people like Fritz Leiber, Ursula Le Guin, um, Roger Zelazny, uh, Cord Wainer Smith, Harlan Ellison, uh, Philip K. Dick. There's a, uh, just a ton of really fine. Uh, Theodore Sturgeon. There's a ton of really good writers who also, many of them wrote short stories, lots of short stories. James Tiptree Jr. is another one um, who, in reality, was named Alice Sheldon and brilliant writer. Anyway, so that's another possibility. I think I flip-flopped these last night, but for now I'll just call that number two. Number two is other science fiction and fantasy writers that I really like and that I would enjoy sharing with you guys, okay? So that's science fiction. Let's just call it science fiction writers. So first is Mortad. Second, science fiction writers. The third one possibility is that I could go back and there's a lot of kind of young adult books um, that were super influential on me. Um, the Wind in the Willows, the E. Nesbitt books, um, the Lloyd Alexander books, all kinds of things that are um, certainly at a level that they can be read just as stories to grown-ups, but also were influential for me and I think just make really nice reading. Um, some that you've probably never heard of, like Kate Cerides' The Singing Tree, which isn't really fantasy, but is still a brilliant book, and who knows, many others, you know, that, that there are possibilities. Um, I was very affected by uh, Swiss Family Robinson when I was young, um, and uh, so that's a third possibility, are sort of children's books, although, again, some of them are kind of classics that could be read by anybody at any age and enjoyed. So, those are my essential three picks. More of my stuff, science fiction writers or children's fiction or young people's fiction. Um, I wouldn't be reading Go Dog Go, obviously, or Green Eggs and Ham. Well, maybe I could read Green Eggs and Ham. But anyway, um, but, you know, books like that, like The Wind in the Willows and stuff, books that are, are uh, influential and were influential to me. Um, so those three. Tad books, science fiction books, uh, children's books. Um, I would love to have you guys just, uh, don't say one, two, or three, because I think I gave it in a different order uh, last night, but um, pick one of those three and let me know what you would prefer, and then I can add these up and see if there's a general trend. <coughs> one of the nice people last night said, I think they all sound great, and I was like, well, that's really nice to know, but that doesn't help me decide. And I need help deciding um, because, frankly, I've got a zillion things to do and I would just really like to get to next week and be able to go, okay, I'm going to read such and such and I'll make sure I have a copy and then bingo, we're off. So that's where we're at. Um, anything else I wanted to say? No, just that I, I, I miss doing this while I was gone. Um, I'm a tragic personality, I guess, you know, who just really likes talking to people. And maybe I even like it best when people can't talk back, but I don't think so. I think I'd like to make this work better so that we can have a more direct communication, or at least that I can easily read, um, you know, uh, comments while I'm while I'm talking instead of having to flip to another application to do so um, and then having to struggle through the weird Facebook thing of like guess what we're not going to show you any of your comments except the last three you know yes there are 70 comments but we're not going to show them to you because I don't know we 
we can't, we can't be trusted with other people's comments, I guess. I don't know what it is. But they've got a really weird system. Anyway, so, so that's it. So the only thing I ask from you guys is let me know if you have a preference. And if you do have a preference, please do let me know. Just write on Facebook or somewhere else. Just say, I want one of these three. I want more Tad books. I want more, I want science fiction stories. I want, you know, kids stuff like The Wind in the Willows or whatever. Um, the Winnie the Pooh books. I could read the Winnie the Pooh books, which are hugely important to me personally. Um, but that doesn't mean the rest of you have to have to give, have to live with that. So um, I will throw it out and throw it open to whoever chooses to do so. So I think that was everything that I wanted to talk about tonight and to tell you just basically, I'm glad to be back. It's lovely to see you all again, albeit virtually. Um, I hope you will join me next week and that we, I will announce when I have a, an idea of what's going to happen next, but I will be doing something at the same TAD time, same TAD channel, 7 p.m. Sunday and 1 a.m. Sunday. Um, I think that's basically it. I, I, as you can tell, I never have any notes. I just, you know, I, th this is one way in which I am in, in George R.R. R. Martin's definition, a pantser. I am not a pantser in my writing, as you know, you all know the difference, right? There's architects and there are people who fly by the seat of their, writers who fly by the seat of their pants and George called them pantsers. But I am a pantser when it comes to broadcasts. I, all my life I did radio, I did other stuff and I don't write things down. I mean, I would if I was doing something that really needed it, but um, you know, like trying to actually impart real information to people to convince them to do something like vote for somebody. But for things like this, I tend to just show up and let you know what's on my mind. So um, that's why I come in here with no plans and that's oftentimes why I probably don't make much sense. But but uh, my, my intentions are good and my heart is warm. <laughs> and I really want to just have a good time with you guys. So please let me know. I'm going to wrap it up here. Please let me know what you think you would like me to do next. And I will see you, either you can join me either at 1 a.m. Sunday next week or at 7 p.m. Sunday next week. And I will see you then. Thank you for caring enough to show up today. I uh, apologize for the lack of reading material, but we will remedy that one way or the other by next week. So that's that. All right. Thanks again. Take good care of yourselves. Take good care of your loved ones and take good care of those around you who may need a helping hand or at least a kind word and peace. And I will talk to you all very, very soon. Okay. Take care.